Good morning. It's good to see you. Donnie, the singing was excellent. You're leading, um, and the, the sound was so encouraging. I don't know how you all feel, but boy. Some of the songs that we sang, the words, you know, you're paying attention to those, and you realize what you're singing, and it just brings, well, it can bring goosebumps to you. I, it does, does to me. I'm, and I realize I'm a little emotional. You say, great, you cried during last sermon. What are you going to do today? Well, today's Brooks, uh, uh, well, it's her last Sunday morning. She'll be with us for a while. She's going back to, to Harding and um, going back to uh, be in a hospital setting uh, as a nursing student or clinical start. So she'll mask up and face shield down and, and uh, help people. That's what she's interested in doing. So encourage her this morning. I know you have and you, and you will. And there are others that are going to be going, I think. Uh, I don't know, Joshua, are you going back or are they shut everything down? When are you, when are you headed back? Friday, okay, Joshua's going. Riley, when are you? Friday, Friday. okay. Anyone else? I'm, boy, here I am getting myself in neck deep now trying to remember who's going where. But so these are going to, going to be going away uh, from us to different universities, and we need to pray for them and uh, have them on our hearts continually. This morning's lesson is the third installment of, or in a series called, called Steadfast Love Stories. If you recall the scripture where God describes himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, I'll read that. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And so this description of God, it's found throughout the entire Bible. And we've looked at some of those areas and you'll find it. It'll crop up in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. It basically is everywhere. Today, I want to examine a scene which at the outset doesn't seem like it would fit. It doesn't seem like it would go with this. I'll just say this at the very beginning. But it, it really does. Because it's a picture of God loving so much that he's going to do something. We're going to look at Mark chapter 11. The scene is Jesus driving out the money changers from the temple. And you say, how does that, how does that fit with Steadfast love, I mean, how is that a picture of that? Well, stay with me. Don't leave. In this chapter of Mark, Mark chapter 11, we see Jesus and his disciples about two miles, a little less than two miles from Jerusalem in Bethany. So they're going to walk. They're going to go from Bethany to Jerusalem, Jerusalem back to Bethany. They're going to make that walk. It would be the equivalent of us leaving this building and walking to Walmart. Doable. Some of us are saying, no, I don't want to do that. Well, this is, this is the walk that they had. Okay, this is the journey. It's not far. It's not far. Just so you have that in mind. So Jesus enters Jerusalem. Now, he enters Jerusalem to the sound of people putting the sight of people putting down palm branches and they're shouting Hosanna. They're shouting Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now they have an inkling as to who he is. But you see the, the big religious leaders of the day. No, no, no. He's not the Messiah. But the people, they're, they're shouting, they're yelling Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David, this is what they were looking forward to. This kingdom that they've heard about all their lives. That Isaiah talked about when he wrote. I mean, they have been looking for this for a long time. And they shout, Hosanna in the highest. Actually, 
one of the gospels that somebody says, hey, tell your disciples, tell these people to be quiet. And he says, Jesus says, if they're quiet, the rocks will cry out. It's amazing, isn't it? That rocks could cry out. They know who Jesus is. Are you telling me that's true? Well, Jesus says it's possible for them to cry. If I try to shut these up, the rocks will cry out. In other words, creation understands. Creation knows. But see, God gives us a choice. He gives us a brain and he allows us to have free thought. We get to choose how we see Jesus. So he enters the temple and he looks around. Then he goes back to Bethany. About two miles back. And so the next day, as he leaves Bethany, he notices, as you do, probably in the morning, you're a little hungry. You ever get that way? Yes, you're human. So is Jesus. So as he leaves Bethany, he's hungry. And he sees a fig tree in full leaf. Now, something that we need to know about the fig tree, which you probably already know this, but <clears throat> when the when the uh, the leaf shows, the leaf and the fruit, they they sort of grow out together. And so when you see a fig tree in leaf, what do you know? There's fruit on it. Now, it really wasn't season for this, but this fig tree was advertising, hey, I have leaves, so I obviously have fruit. Well, he doesn't find any figs on the tree. It wasn't the season for figs. Although the tree was advertising. You like that. Huh? I see some of you like that when I did that. Don't encourage me, please. Um, so Jesus notices that the tree's in full leaf, not the time or the season for figs, but he notices this. And Jesus curses the fig tree. I mean, you may say, that's pretty brutal. I mean, what? You know, so the fig tree was sort of confused. But he curses the fig tree. May no one ever eat fruit from you again, he says. And you know what? That happened. So he enters the temple. Well, and it says, the scripture says, and the disciples were listening. Now that's important. When Mark says, I want you to know this, his disciples were paying attention. They were listening. And what was it all about? It was about the fig tree. This insignificant thing. Jesus was hungry. He, he sees the tree and leaf. He goes up. There's no, there's no figs on it. So he curses the tree. And then he goes on to the temple. He enters the temple and he rids it of the money changers. Now, some people may say, boy, Jesus was really hungry. I mean, have you seen those Snickers commercials? But that's not what this is about. He's not so hungry that he's angry. Although you might be sometimes, I don't know. But all of this is done for a reason. So he enters the temple. He rids it of the money changers. And then he teaches those that are surrounding him. He teaches them. And he says, it says, as, as he taught them, he said, it is not, or is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations. Now that's a quote from Isaiah 56, verse 7. And then he goes on to say, but you have made it a den of robbers. That's from Jeremiah 7, 11. So when evening came, he went back to Bethany. So he's going back and forth. You see this. So the next morning, the disciples noticed that the fig tree that Jesus cursed it is withered from the roots. How do you know if something's withered from the roots? We have a certain spot that we've tried for years to plant a tree. I think Lee and I have concluded that's a bad spot. Because at first, you know, we didn't water it. And we're thinking, well, that may be the problem right there. So we water it. And we're thinking, we watered it too much. And so it died. You know, the second tree, the third tree, the fourth tree. You know, 
I don't know what the company is, but you send away, you can get trees. They send you a free one every now and then. And, and they'll take the ones back that, you know, they'll just send you another one if you say it died. I'm thinking they're thinking something's up with these people because they keep saying the trees died, but it has. There's a dead tree. You can come to my, my house. There's a dead little tiny tree, a little sapling, two years, two dead trees there in that spot. Okay. So we're either not good at it. And then Steve asked me, hey, do you have any pin oaks that might? Well, they died too. So I don't know what's going on. How do you know if something's dead from the roots? Do you ever, you ever uh, at a, a little, a small tree and you, and you sort of take your thumbnail and you scratch one of the limbs? What are you looking for? Something green, right? Or you see if it's flexible, but it snaps off and you're going, well. I don't think there's much life here. So you go on down and you scratch or you snap the whole thing off and you say, this is dead from the roots. I mean, there, there's nothing going on here. That's what happened to this tree. It's dead from the roots up. It's gone. So you have made, you have made it a den of robbers. Evening comes, they go back to Bethany and then they see the tree the next morning. Fig trees withered from the roots up. And Jesus tells them, what does he tell them? After looking at the fig tree and it's withered from the roots up, he says, he says something to his disciples, have faith in God. I want you to have faith in God. Now, faith is something that impresses Jesus. If you know anything about him, if you know anything about the gospels, what you see if you see someone having faith and Jesus is there, it, it, it's something that he points out. You remember the, the four fellows that lowered their paralyzed friend down through the roof? It says Jesus saw their faith. What did he see? He saw them taking the roof off and lowering their friend down. That's faith. And he sees that. Well, what does the fig tree have to do with the temple? And, and why does he put these two things together? Well, they're powerful visuals. This, this fig tree was for the disciples, right? Not everybody in Jerusalem got to see that. It was for them. But then he gets into the temple and he does what he does. And everybody sees that. So why put these two events together? Well, they're meaningful. They're powerful. They should be meaningful to us. But, you know, to some, the temple scene, when Jesus sort of cleanses the temple... When he overturns the tables, um, some people only use this as an excuse to justify their anger. Is that true? Am I, am I saying something that isn't true? You ever heard somebody say, Jesus overturned the tables, the tables. I mean, he he did that. He cleansed the temple. I'm just angry like Jesus. If you go back to Exodus 34, what does it say about God? What does God say to Moses? And what is God all about? He is slow to what? James tells us, be slow to anger, right? This is, this is God. And this is what Jesus is demonstrating here. He's not just, he doesn't just go around uh, to places and, and he's angry with everybody. And are you kidding me? If, if Jesus was this way, with everyone that treated him as if he wasn't Jesus, he would be turning tables over. He would be, he would be the most angry, physical person you would have ever read about, right? Because he would have been going around just because everyone seemed to be against him, especially the religious leaders. But Jesus wasn't like that. And so the tree and the temple were supposed to provide nourishment. Obviously the tree, physical nourishment. But did Jesus get any from that tree? No, he didn't. So the temple is, in verse 17, was supposed to be, he says, a house of prayer for just God's people. The only, for, for the the nations, right? For God's people, right? So, prayer. What is prayer? 
Isn't it connection with God? When you pray, aren't you connecting with God? Isn't that what it's about? This is why we don't just mindlessly pray. This is why he wants us to think about what we're saying. Because it's a connection to him. All right, let's make some application and then we'll be done. All right, sound good? Let's do this. Think about the fig tree for just a moment. If you're a Christian, if you're a Christian this morning, you are promising to be helpful in demonstrating Jesus to the world. Did you know that? That's what you've promised to do. That's what you've signed up to do. If you're a Christian, you're going to demonstrate Jesus to the world. And you're saying, I'm all in with the mission of Jesus. Every single bit, I'm in. Whatever He wants me to do, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm, that's what I'm interested in doing. So you're pledging your life to Jesus when you're a Christian. That's what you're saying that, that you're doing. And Scripture seems to reflect that's the expectation. Romans 6, Paul says, you're, well, when you're raised... When you're raised from from your baptism, you're raised into what? A new life. Well, what does that new life look like? What does it look like? Well, Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. This is the life. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So you're saying, I will participate in connecting mankind to God through Jesus. That's what you're saying when you're saying you're a Christian. You are the point of contact. You are that point of contact for the world. So be careful. So be careful. James chapter 1 verse 22 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. It would be a deceitful thing for us just to say, Yes, I know all of that. Well, James would say, Are you doing it? Hey, Christian, are you doing it? Are you awake in all settings? Are you living this life? Don't just listen, but do it. In Psalm One verses two and three, it tells us that a a person delights and meditates on what God says. That person that does that is like a tree planted by streams of water. Here we go with the tree again. It's like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. In season and whose leaf does not wither. If you're a Christian If you're a Christian this morning, others should be able to see the fruit of the Spirit of Christ that's growing in your life. And it should also be available for everyday use, right? If you're a Christian, the fruit of the Spirit should be there, should be growing in you. At least. And available to those who are not Christians, right? What's the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5. The Spirit produces the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the things. So when you're the point of contact to the world for Jesus, these are the things that the world gets the sample from you. So I don't get the right to go around being angry all the time. I don't. Jesus won't let me be that way if I'm following Him. No, I can do my own thing. I can say, I'm a Christian and yet act like this. Listen. That's not how I'm directed through Scripture. So... If you have no intention, now hear me and hear me good on this one. If you have no intention of listening and following Jesus, 
Do everyone a favor. Don't call yourself a Christian. If you have no intention of following Him and serving Him and being like Him, do us all a favor. Do the world a favor and stop calling yourself a Christian if you're unwilling to be like Him in all settings. Wow, where did that come from? Do you believe that? You say you're being too harsh. Now I don't like you very much. <laughs> well, obviously none of us are perfect, right? So you're a Christian this morning and you're struggling. Is that okay? Are we allowed to struggle? Yeah, we are. We're not perfect. We're not, none of us are perfect followers of Jesus, right? None of us are. We all make mistakes. We all, but listen, there is a, a huge difference between trying and giving no effort at all, right? You can see that. If you're an employer, can you see that in your employee? Whether they're actually trying to do something, trying to get it right, or they're just giving no effort at all. Do you notice the difference between the two? When you ask your child to go do this, you give them a task, you give them a, the dreaded chore, you know. You can tell whether they're actually trying or they're just not giving any effort at all. I mean, giving no effort at all is staying in their bedroom, right? That's no effort. But getting up and doing something, that's some kind of effort. So I'm not, not trying to be harsh with us. I'm just saying this. Listen, we need to be examining our own lives and taking a hard look at how we're living. We're either serving Jesus or we're not. We're either being like Him or we're not. We can't use the excuse of Jesus overturning the tables in the temple as an excuse for our anger in certain settings. It is not the same. It doesn't equate. I don't think it does. Because what Jesus wanted people to see was God. Okay. Let's think about the temple. The reason for Jesus clearing the temples found in John chapter 2 verse 17, um, which comes from Psalm 69, verse 9. John 2, 17. I, I love this uh, from the King James Version. But I'm going to read it out of the NIV and the uh, NCV first, and then the King James. You'll see three different or three readings of the, of the same scripture here. Verse 17. Zeal for your house will consume me. And it did, right? I mean, he's in there. He's turning over the tables. He's consumed with what is supposed to be going on here at the house of the Lord in the temple. It's God's house. And then the NCV, my strong love for you, for your temple completely controls me. I can see that. <clears throat> but the one I love, the reading I love the best is out of the King James. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Don't you love that? Isn't that descriptive? The zeal for your house has just eaten me up. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty visual there. It comes from Psalm 69 verse 9. And that says, the zeal for your house consumes me. And this is what Jesus was Getting across. So Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, and Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, says that God is a jealous God. Now we're going to talk about jealousy tonight. And in that lesson, we'll, we'll talk about good jealousy and bad jealousy. All right? But for our purposes this morning, the, this scripture, these two verses say that God is a jealous God. And that means he has a strong desire. He has a strong desire that, that all the affections that, are, that belong to Him, that are due Him in the hearts of His people, come to Him rather than going to other people or other things. And you want a God like that. You, you want a God that loves in this way. 
James chapter 4, verse 5. God jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. God jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. Romans 8, 15 says through, through Christ, well, you've been spiritually adopted. Is what the verse is talking about. First Corinthians chapter six, verse nine says this. Paul says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you? Who you have received from God? You're not your own. So we've moved from the physical temple that Jesus went into, right? He's crucified, he's buried, he's raised. And now Paul's saying, listen, it's not the physical temple anymore. It's you. It's your body. He has placed his spirit in you. If you're a Christian, it's what we're talking about. You have the spirit of Christ in you. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We get that, right? So, you're not your own. That was one of the lines in one of the songs that we sang this morning. So it's, it's safe to say that Jesus would desire the same of us as he, as he did that temple and that setting, right? Because we have become temples housing the Holy Spirit. So would Jesus feel the same about you as he did about the temple? Would he feel the same about you now as he did the temple when he was alive? You see. So. Is there anything preventing others from connecting to God through you? You're the point of contact, right? You're the temple that houses the spirit of Christ. Does the same zeal consume Jesus for you, the temple of the Spirit? Is it possible in our behavior to make God jealous for what has been committed to Him? Is it possible for me as a Christian, is it possible for you as a Christian to make God jealous? Because, listen, the temple was committed... I mean, in, when Jesus walked into the temple, he says, this should be a house of prayer for the nations. And he turns the tables over. And now you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple. Could you make God jealous? Has anything taken the place of God in your life at all? So think about this. Think about your own life. You think about your life. I'll think about my life. Trust me. I've been thinking about this for quite a while in preparation for this lesson. If Jesus watched your life, that's what he does. He goes into the temple right in the in, in Mark 11. He goes from Bethany to the temple and he walks in and he looks around and he goes back to Bethany. If Jesus watched your life and thoughtfully considered your ways. If Jesus today just stepped in to your temple. Your life. I want to ask you this. What would he seek to drive from you? What would he seek to overturn? What would he seek to cleanse you of this very morning? If he walked into the temple of your life this morning and looked around. What would he say? This has to go. What is it? What one thing? I mentioned that to someone this morning. They said one thing. Yeah, let's just deal with one thing at a time, right? Think about it for a moment. If I said we're going to take one minute to think about this and be silent, that would be a long, long minute. That would be an eternal minute. That's what that would seem like. But think about it. Don't let this lesson 
just fall flat on the floor this morning. Take it with you. Think about this. If Jesus walked into my life, what would he want to drive out? Now, here's the thing about this is that God lets you do what you want to do. So Jesus is not going to force his way into your life. He's not going to force this out of your life. Now, there'll come a day if we don't give up certain things. Even as Christians, if we don't give these things up, it's going to hurt us. Because that's something that doesn't belong in the temple. Does that make sense? In your life. That's what I'm saying. So what would he want to drive out of your life today? God's love is steadfast. Aren't you glad? I mean, he loves us. And this really, this really is about his love, his zeal, his passion, his concern for what's going on. Mark 11 is. But I believe this. I believe God means you no harm. Do you believe that? I believe he, he, he's not intending to harm you. But he's, also, he's not giving us an excuse to hang on to the things that we don't need to hang on to. He wants us to give those things up. But he's not going to step into your life and make a whip or, or start turning tables over and driving things out of your life. I wish some days he would just do that with me. I don't know about you, but I surely wish some days he would just drive it out and I wouldn't have to. There would be no effort on my part whatsoever. But this takes effort. You have to want to remove these things. So you have to see him clearly. He means you no harm. It matters to him that you are connected. So if you're not a Christian this morning, why don't you? Why don't you be connected with him? Through Jesus. Allow him to, through the blood of Jesus, wash your sins away this very day. You can be baptized into Christ. You can repent of your sins and confess him as Lord. And then you live, you're raised to walk in this new life. If you are a Christian, remember this. You were bought with a price, right? You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. Today, it matters what we do. It matters to us. It matters to the world. And ultimately, it matters to God. So if you have something that you need to let go of, why don't you do that this morning as we stand and sing?